Okay, please go. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, faster and more accurate surface code decoders. Um, and so uh, I'll be talking about two separate projects. So the first one is Sparse Blossom, correcting a million errors per core second with minimal weight matching. This is a joint work with Craig Gidney. And then the second is improved decoding of circuit level noise and fragile boundaries of Taylor's surface codes. Uh, so I'll talk about the decoding aspect of this work. Um, and so both of these projects make improvements to decoders for surface codes. So that's improvements for the algorithms for uh, processing data from um, quantum computers built uh, designed to be surface codes. And so I'll start with some motivation and background about quantum correction and decoders and surface codes. Um, then I'll talk about the sparse blossom, um, the faster decoding. Um, so I'll give an overview of the minimum weight perfect minimum weight perfect matching decoder, Edmonds blossom algorithm, uh, our sparse blossom algorithm, and then uh, our results. And then uh, I'll talk about more accurate decoding. So this is the belief matching decoder. Um, so yeah, I'll give some background on this, um, on belief propagation and uh, circuit level tanographs. I'll, I'll define our decoders and then uh, give the results which show that it's more accurate than, than matching. Um, and I'll conclude. So, uh, okay, so some quick background on quantum error correction. Um, so quantum error correction is necessary for scalable and useful uh, quantum computing. Um, and so we encode um, some logical qubits and logical operations into many more physical qubits and physical operations. So we add redundancy um, to, to ensure that building a quantum computer from unreliable components, we can um, implement an arbitrarily reliable uh, quantum computation. And the surface code is the most widely considered quantum error correcting code, which is the um, and it's the uh, and it is the sort of subject of uh, in 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 the roadmaps of many large industrial efforts to build a quantum computer. And so on the right here is a surface code, um, and so each circle here is a physical qubit. Um, the yellow circles are called the data qubits, and the um, the black circles here are called the ancillary qubits, which are measured. And um, I won't go into the definition of stabilizers in the stabilizer group, perhaps some of you are familiar. Um, but the point is that this one patch of many physical qubits encodes a single logical qubit. Um, so applying some sequence of operations on a column or a row of this um, uh, of the surface code will implement two particular logical operations. So implement logical operations on the logical qubit. Um, and just this one patch only encodes a single logical qubit out of many physical qubits. So there's a very large overhead to quantum error correction using the surface code. Um, now, to implement a surface code um, on a gate-based device, such as a superconducting quantum computer, requires a circuit. And so this is the circuit implementing the surface code um, using these particular gates, these CNOT gates and measurements. And again, the details here again aren't too important. Um, other than a few, the key point here is that we're implementing this set of operations on the device using nearest neighbor operations. And if some error occurs, such as this X error here, Pauli X error, um, then that will change the outcome of two of these measurements, for example, here, for example. So this, these yellow stars correspond to a change in the outcome of measurements. And so then the goal of a decoder is to take these measurement outcomes and use these measurement outcomes to infer which errors could have occurred um, to correct the errors. And so yeah, this is just a summary of that. So the decoder, the decoder takes in the syndrome measurement data. So the measurement outcomes from these ancillary qubits um, process slightly. And then as well as a model for the noise, some prior um, some priors for each of the possible error mechanisms that could occur in the circuit. And the decoder takes all of this information and then makes some prediction as to which logical error occurred. Um, and I say logical error prediction rather than physical error prediction um, because yeah, the decoder doesn't need to output the full prediction of which physical error occurred everywhere in the circuit. It just needs to predict correctly um, wh what the outcome of how the errors affected the logical outcome of the circuit, the, the, the errors on the logical qubits. And so a more accurate decoder is by definition more likely to make the correct prediction. And so when I say they say the decoder is more accurate, it, that's what it, that's what I mean. And the logical error rate of, a de of an error correcting code with a decoder is the fraction of the time that the, that you incorrectly predict which logical error occurred. 
and you make a mistake. So why do we need fast decoders? Well, one reason is for um, real-time decoding. So a large fault-tolerant quantum computer um, constructed, uh, say, a surface code, a, a superconducting quantum computer, um, will generate around one terabyte of data per second. And it turns out, um, as pointed out in this review by Barbara Terha, um, that the decoder must match the throughput um, to, to prevent this, this syndrome data backlog increasing exponentially in uh, the depth of the computation, the particular depth of the computation. Um, and again, like I won't, you know, I won't go into the full details, but there are some points in circuits such as here, and these are two logical qubits, we're making some logical, making some measurement of one of these encoded logical qubits um, determines what gate is applied on some other logical qubit. And so the, this other gate has to wait for the measurement of this logical qubit to be processed. Uh, and this is this is one of the reasons why you the decoder needs to match the throughput, the rate at which the syndrome data is generated um, to prevent the decoder essentially becoming a bottleneck, which um, results in this exponential backlog blow up of amount of data, data required to be stored. Um, and so, yeah, so this terabyte data per second is assuming for a, for a superconducting quantum computer. And here, that cycle, that sort of circuit I showed you before um, of the surface code, that takes around one microsecond for a superconducting quantum computer. And so our decoder needs to keep up with that. And so a goal for real-time decoding is to decode a distance 30 surface code and the, the distance uh, for surface codes is just the width of that patch. So I think the one I showed you before was probably distance five, but you, you ideally want to be able to decode a distance 30 surface code in one microsecond per round at a particular level, it's a rate of noise of this sort of 1.1% second noise. And I can go into details of what I mean by this later if needed. Okay, so that's one reason we might want fast decoders. Um, but another, so that's to actually construct a quantum computer but another important reason is for error correction simulations. And so to evaluate the performance of error correcting codes, um, we'll often use uh, you know, error, correction, error correction research often requires using say direct Monte Carlo sampling. And this is very expensive um, because logical error rates should be rare by definition. So if you want to evaluate different error correcting codes, that means taking many, many samples, often hundreds of millions of samples of shots from these very large circuits, um, to carry out sort of typical analyses. Um, and so decoder is uh, a subroutine in this in these simulation tasks. So it's important that the decoder is fast to enable um, error correction, uh, to enable sort of um, more error correction research and uh, to open up new avenue, avenues of research. So fast decoders are also important tools for error correction research. Okay, so that's why we might need fast decoders why don't we need accurate decoders? What are the implications? Well, a more accurate decoder can lead to higher thresholds. So that means that we can suppress, um, the threshold is the error rate below which you can um, increase the size of your system and then reduce the um, logical failure rate. So that means that with a higher threshold, you can suppress errors using error correction with less reliable devices. And it also can result in lower overheads. That means that for some given uh, sort of physical error rate, the quality of components and some desired logical failure rate, uh, a more accurate decoder can require fewer physical qubits. So let's suppose rather than this, say you have this huge surface code on the left with some particular decoder, maybe you could use some more accurate decoder and instead use this smaller surface code to achieve the same logical failure rates. So these are two reasons why, um, yeah, you might want. Uh, more accurate decoding. Okay, so now I'll uh, give an overview of um, sparse bosom. And this is looking at uh, making a particular widely used decoder called the minimum weight perfect match decoder uh, much faster and also releasing it as an open source tool. Um, and I'll just give a bit of even uh, more background still on uh, decoders and, and some, give some definitions. Uh, so a detector is a parity of measurement outcomes in a quantum error correction circuit. Um, and in particular, which is deterministic if no errors have occurred. So let's say it just, this is a, an example of an error correction circuit, which has these measurement gates here. 
Um, this detector, say D naught, it is equal to the XOR of uh, these two measurements, M naught and M1. And so in an error-free circuit, this would be um, deterministic, or in this case, this is zero. Um, but if an error occurs, for example, this X error here, this error mechanism will flip this detector. It will change the outcome of this detector from zero to one um, because it will change the outcome of the second measurement, therefore changing the parity. A detection event is a detector outcome that is flipped relative to its expected value. Um, so often when we talk about the syndrome, um, we just talk about the subset of the detectors whose value has changed. Often that's a very small fraction of the overall number of detectors. Um, so this is a sparse representation um, of the syndrome. Um, and generally each error mechanism will cause a small constant number of detection events. Um, so the, yeah, this error mechanism will cause um, uh, only, in this case, only one detection event to change. Normally it's a small constant, say up to, up to um, four, say. Um, and likewise, every detector is normally flipped by some small constant number of possible error mechanisms. Um, and finally, there's a, a logical observable. Um, this is essentially corresponds to measuring the actual state of the logical qubit. So uh, it's, a, it's some set of measurement outcomes or the parity of a set of measurement outcomes that corresponds to actually measuring the information that you, you've encoded and protected. Um, and so we want our decoder to correctly predict the logical observable. We want to preserve the logical information so that we, we correctly measure the outcome of the logical qubit when we measure it. So that's also a just a parity of measurement outcomes, but it corresponds to um, yeah, measuring the information rather than just the stabilizers, which give you information about the errors. Um, so how do we, um, so the, 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 this first decoder I'm talking about uses what's called a detector graph. And so this is a graphical representation of the noise model, um, which is used by the decoder. And so for some error correcting codes, such as the surface code, it is sufficient to consider only the error mechanisms which cause either one or two detection events. Um, and so we define this detector graph where there's a node, uh, also sometimes called a matching graph or a decoder graph literature, but I'll call it a detector graph here. And so there's a node for each detector and then an edge or a half edge for each error mechanism. So here, so each node here corresponds to it. So it's some, a detector, a parity of measurement outcomes, and then each edge is an error mechanism which flips the detectors at its endpoints. So for example, this red highlighted edge here, this is, let's assume that this red, highlighted, this red highlighted edge is an error mechanism which is flipped. This has caused these two detection events, the blue stars here, which just correspond to minus one or to an odd parity of measurement outcomes rather than even um, for these detectors. And so, yeah, that's why we can represent it as an edge um, or if it's on the boundary, so we say that this is a boundary edge because this error mechanism here will only flip the outcome of this detector. This is just a virtual node, a boundary node. And then we assign a weight. This is a weighted graph and the weight of each edge is the log likelihood ratio of the probability that the corresponding error mechanism occurs. Um, and so for example, in a surface code, um, yeah, two types of errors, these Pauli X and, and, and Pauli Z errors. Uh, both graph-like, they have this property. But there are some error mechanisms that occur called these, these Pauli Y errors, uh, which don't have this property. But it turns out for surface codes and many other similar quantum error correcting codes, it's sufficient to correct a subset um, of the types of error mechanisms that can occur um, to kind of reliable, reliably perform error correction, to, to perform error correction up to the code distance more specifically. Um, OK. So the minimum weight perfect matching decoder finds the most probable graph-like physical error. Um, so given this assumption, given this approximation I just told you where you only consider the error mechanisms that flip one or two detectors, given that assumption, it finds the most probable individual sort of set of physical errors. Um, a maximum likelihood decoder would instead find the most probable logical error, graph-like or not. So there's a slight difference here because I told you before that the, 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 the decoder only needs to make a prediction of the logical error that has occurred, um, not the physical error. Uh, so it turns out that the decoder doesn't actually, sorry, yeah, is there a question? 
No, no question on our side. No, no, go ahead. Okay, sorry, so I heard something on the audio. Um, yeah, so given, um, yeah, so given a, uh, the, decoder, the decoder only needs to predict the logical error um, and the, the logical correction can still be correct even if the physical, the prediction of the physical error differs from the actual error that occurred. So there are some residual errors which are harmless. These are called stabilizers. Um, and so finding the most probable error isn't the, the optimal thing to do. The optimal thing to do is to find the most probable logical error that occurred, which involves summing over, essentially COSAT, summing over many possible physical errors. But minimal perfect matching is a heuristic, which instead seeks just to find the most probable physical error and moreover makes the approximation that it is graph-like. And so this corresponds when after all this, this mapping, this approximation and this mapping to a graph, uh, solving this, this decoder solves what we refer to as a minimum weight embedded matching problem in this detector graph. In particular, it finds the set of edges. So given, given the decoder takes its input, these just only sees these blue stars, these detection events, just the measurement outcomes, but does not know the red stars, obviously, that's the, the errors. And given this input, um, it finds uh, the set of edges of minimum total weight, such that each, each detection event is instant to an odd number of edges, and the remaining nodes are instant to an even number of edges. And this optimization problem is known as the minimum weight T-join problem in the graph theory literature. Um, and it can be solved via reduction to the minimum weight perfect matching problem. And that's the reason for the decoder's name. And this reduction uh, was first shown by Edmonds and Johnson in 1973. Okay, so just to recall, what is a minimum weight perfect matching? Uh, well, a perfect matching is a set of edges M in some graph G um, that is instant to exactly, uh, so it's just such that every node is instant to exactly one edge in M. Um, and a minimum weight perfect matching is a perfect matching for which the sum of the weights of the edges is minimized. So that's a minimum weight perfect matching, which is used in the reduction. And this minimum weight perfect matching can be solved by Edmund's uh, Blossom algorithm. I'll talk more about soon. So what's this reduction? Well, this embedded matching problem, this is the decoding problem or the T-join problem, um, can be solved via this reduction. And how does this work? Well, you start off with this, this, this string like um, these errors, these, these errors, these red errors here, and the detection events. Um, uh, and, you, and of course, you only know the graph and the detection events. You then use Dijkstra searches to, to construct this complete graph of detection events that I'll refer to as the path graph. And so this consists of, this has a node for every detection event, and then an edge uh, for every pair of edges, sorry, for every pair of nodes in this path graph, there is an edge with a weight equal to the distance between those two nodes in the original detector graph. Um, and so this has a quadratically more, since this is a sparse graph, this has quadratically more edges, and each edge here, um, the, the weight is found by Dijk's research. Um, then from this complete graph on the detection events, we then solve the minimum weight perfect matching problem in this graph, uh, to this, shown here on the right. And then you can map these um, paths back to the edges in the original detector graph, and that's the solution. Um, so this is the reduction to the minimum weight perfect matching problem. So you can show that this, this reduction solves this embedded matching problem. Uh, and so a common sort of naive approach to implementing this matching decoder might be just to literally do this sequentially. Um, and so if you solve each step sequentially, say you have some subroutines, say you have just like you use some Dijkstra subroutine and you go to some library and use Blossom, so it's a problem. It's, it's horrifically slow um, uh, because you have to construct this quadratically larger path graph, um, which immediately, so it immediately gives you this quadratic overhead of just constructing the graph, let alone solving it with Blossom. Um, so although it's horrifically uh, slow, it was, or in the error correction community, it's been a kind of a common way to implement the decoder just because it's sort of simple to implement in some sense. And so early, sort of the beginning of my PhD when I was doing research on, on using, using um, matching decoders, I, kind of, I, I wrote this uh, package called Pi Matching, which is, and this project is making is sort of a new version for Pi Matching, but in Pi Matching version one, um, kind of, which I wrote in the first year of my PhD, um, uh, for another research project, this uh, completes, essentially I just approximated this complete uh, complete graph, this path graph, and truncated it based upon locality. 
essentially just uh, truncated and removed the edges with high weight, um, which is much faster than solving the full problem sequentially. It turns out that the approximation it introduces is also not too bad. I mean, the, the, the accuracy is almost exactly the same as the original matching decoder. Um, and, and also, asymptotically, the, the performance is, is roughly sort of li roughly linear time, but the speed is still very far from optimal. I mean, the constant factors are bad. Um, and so this project, uh, essentially, we uh, wrote a much faster version, more optimized version of matching, um, which completely avoids the need to construct this explicit path graph at all. Um, so yeah, so it's conceptually it's similar to some earlier work just by Austin Fowler from 2013. Uh, but Austin, so conceptually similar in the sense that the Dykes research in this earlier work was performed, this construction of the path graph was sort of performed adaptively during the Blossom algorithm. So rather than solving the problem fully sequentially, um, essentially it was adaptively switching between Dykes researchers and Blossom. Um, so, you know, you define some initial exploration radius around a detection event for the Dykes research and then expand this region as required by the, the Blossom algorithm and alternate between these Dykes researchers and Blossom. So our approach is conceptually similar, similar, but differs in many of the uh, many of the details. So there isn't really a separate Dijkstra and Blossom step. It's just one, in some sense, some sense, just one one algorithm. Um, and essentially, we're just removing the explicit construction of this path graph, which results in a sort of a quadratic improvement in the expected running time, um, and much faster, um, absolute running time. Uh, yeah, so as I say, the path graphs never constructed explicitly, and the edges in this path graph are discovered by sparse blossom exactly when they're, when they're needed by the blossom algorithm. And so these, these path graph edges are never stored or found if they're not needed by this blossom algorithm, which I'll, I haven't yet defined or talked about, but I will be soon. Um, and so you can think of it as adapting blossom rather than sort of using this kind of reduction. In some sense, uh, you can and think of it as we're adapting the blossom algorithm to the decoding problem, which differs in these details, um, whereby, uh, yeah, the details I've already said, the different, essentially the differences between the embedded matching problem um, and the uh, perfect matching problem. And one key point I haven't yet mentioned is that the distribution of possible, oops, the distribution of possible um, problems uh, uh, is caused by flipping these edges independently. And that means that it's exponentially unlikely to see a large cluster um, of errors. So that means that these detection events are generally geometrically close, or they're, they're close um, together in the graph. The, the distance between the detection events, which should be paired up, is very small. Um, and the probability of having a large path, a large chain of errors um, is exponentially small. And so this distribution is very important for um, achieving a very good expected running time for error correction. And it's important to exploit this property when optimizing a decoder. Um, okay, so what is the Blossom algorithm? Well, it was discovered by Edmonds, and it was the first polynomial time algorithm for finding perfect matchings in graphs. Um, and then uh, Edmonds also generalized it to find minimum weight perfect matchings, which is what we're using. And it uh, finds a perfect matching through a search for these augmenting paths. So what is an augmenting path? So now you can imagine now that we're just looking at explicitly the path graph. So we'll come back to the detector graph uh, we're talking about sparse blossom, but for the original blossom algorithm, this is just a, a graph that we're trying to find a minimum weight perfect matching in or a perfect matching. And so a, a path graph is, um, so, so an augmenting path is a path between unmatched nodes alternating between matched and unmatched edges. So if this dotted line here is an unmatched edge in a graph and the solid line is a matched edge, this would be an augmenting path um, and augmenting an augmenting path increases the cardinality of the matching. So if we flip the matched and unmatched edges, we end up with one extra matched edge in the graph. And so by Burgess theorem, a matching is maximum if and only if there is no augmenting path. And so this is going to provide a high level idea for how to find a perfect matching in a graph. You find an augmenting path in the graph, then you augment it, and then you repeat. Um, and so then the problem is how to find these augmenting paths. And uh, the way this is done in the Blossom algorithm is to grow and merge alternating trees. 
And so an alternating tree is a tree subgraph. So yeah, this path, I should say, this is just a subgraph of the full graph. And so here an alternating tree is a tree subgraph that alternates between matched and unmatched edges. Um, so it has some unmatched node as a root with a single unmatched node in any of every alternating tree, which is the root. And then it, all this tree alternates like so between matched and unmatched edges. And so there is an alternating tree for every unmatched node and these start out as just trivial trees, just a root node. And then during the algorithm, these trees are grown uh, in order to find these uh, augmenting paths and to augment them. And so to see how this works, we can see that when two trees connect like this, so these two subgraphs, let's say you're performing the search, this sort of structured search in the graph, and you, two of these alternating trees connect like so, um, then this green path between the two roots is an augmenting path, um, which can be augmented to increase the number of edges in the matching. Um, and so we can repeat this process handling some important special cases, um, the cycles which give rise to blossoms, hence the name of the algorithm, but I won't go into the details of that right now. Um, we can eventually obtain a perfect matching. So that's finding the, a, a, a perfect matching. But then the question is, how do we find a minimum weight perfect matching? So taking into account the edge weights, um, and Edmund has formulated the minimum weight perfect matching problem as a linear program. Um, and essentially, you can think of this as providing constraints on how the alternating trees can grow. Uh, and, and these are the constraints for those familiar with linear, linear programming. These are constraints for the dual linear program and, and the complementary slackness conditions. And by the strong duality theorem of linear programming, this guarantees the optimality once the perfect matching is found. Uh, but actually, this linear programming uh, formulation provide, it provides a motivation for the bottom algorithm and it's proof of optimality, but it's not completely required for either. Um, but, but we'll use some terminology from the linear program, um, such as dual variables and, and, and slack. This is the motivation for the, the minimum weight matching problem. So um, let's define a dual variable y, uh, y u for each node u. Uh, or odd size set of nodes in the graph. And this is always non-negative when, the, uh, when this, uh, the algorithm is applied to the path graph um, that I mentioned earlier on. So we can visualize these dual variables. This is essentially just a variable in the linear program. Uh, and we can visualize this of dual linear program. We can visualize the dual variables as a radius of some region centered on a node or odd size set of nodes. So again, just considering just, this is just Edmund's bottom algorithm on some um, Edmund's blossom algorithm applied on some graph. Um, we can kind of visualize these dual variables as uh, some radius of some sort of virtual region in the graph, um, and then define this slack, um, uh, which um, is and if we say, the slack, which essentially is just the edge weight minus the dual variables, summed in some uh in, in, in intuitive way shown in this, this figure which i work in as well as shown at the bottom here but the details aren't too important right now um but this slack we say that this edge is tight if the slack is zero um essentially the edge weight minus the relevant dual variables um is zero um, and so the reason i'm drawing this is this is just the original blossom algorithm uh but drawing the um the dual variables this way um it will be, become clear how we sort of generalize this to the decoding problem in our approach, or the T-join problem in a minute. Uh, so weighted blossom essentially is just, it's just unweighted blossom, um, but with these added constraints. So again, we're, we're growing these alternating trees, but now we say that these tree edges are only allowed um, for tight edges. Um, so these bl blue and red regions here correspond to the dual variables, which add are these constraints. Um, which have to be uh, um, satisfied. And so we grow and shrink these constraints. So if we grow the, the blue regions and shrink the red ones, essentially we inc increase the, the dual variable here and decrease this one, we can keep these edges being tight, but expand the region of search for each of these trees in some sense. Like uh, we could, this, this node, this, we might discover some new edge here, which becomes tight, which allows us to, um, uh, which allows us to find an augmenting path. And so we grow these trees while satisfying a constraint by growing and shrinking these dual variable of regions. Uh, I'm calling them regions for a reason we'll see later on. Um, and so it, it turns out that the, applying these constraints ensures that the weight of the perfect matching 
we find is minimum once it's found. Um, so what I've described so far is a kind of an overview. Um, I haven't gone into all the details, but an overview of Edmonds's Blossom algorithm. And our sparse, bloss sparse Blossom algorithm, which instead solves the decoding problem or the T-join problem or the minimum weight embedded matching problem, whatever you want to call it, which slightly differs from the perfect matching problem, essentially generalizes or changes slightly the, the concepts in Blossom. So this dual variable I described, just this, uh, this dual variable on some node in the graph, now becomes the radius of what we call a graph fill region containing the detection event U. Um, so now rather than just being a, a variable assigned to a node in the path graph, this now corresponds to the radius of exploratory growth of some region, this sort of blue region. So the background here is a detector graph in, in black, and this blue uh, circle here is an exploratory region with this detection event as the source and the radius of this region. I mean, the circle is not a, literally a circle, it's just kind of a, it's a cartoon schematic. Um, but the detection event is the source, and then the radius of this exploratory region is corresponds to this dual variable in the original Blossom algorithm. And so whereas in the original dual Blossom algorithm, you might increase this dual variable on some node by some amount delta, instead in sparse Blossom, we will grow this exploratory region by some amount delta. So this corresponds to literally exploring the detector graph um, with a region centered on a detection event or uh, it's actually, yeah, or a set of detection events comprising a blossom, which I haven't defined. <laughs> um, but yeah, or we can, de or decreasing a dual variable um, in the original blossom algorithm corresponds to shrinking, um, to, to a shrinking a graph or region. So this red region here corresponds to a shrinking region. Um, and so it's essentially ex shrinking an exploratory region by some amount delta. And an edge in an alternating tree in the original blossom algorithm in this path graph is what we call a, a compressed edge, which represents the shortest path between detection events. So here in this representation on the right, we have this kind of dotted line here or this solid line here. This corresponds to the shortest path between these two de detection events. And so this does correspond to an edge in the path graph, which I showed you in that earlier slide with the, the reduction. Um, so we do store some of them, but we only store the ones which are relevant to the Blossom algorithm that are actually part of these um, sort of important data structures, such as alternating trees, um, yeah, and, and also other, others such as uh, blossoms and measures um, in, in the Blossom algorithm. And so the algorithm progresses along a timeline. So these growing regions are grown with, uh, so I mean, init init yeah, grown with one distance, one distance unit per time unit, and then shrinking regions are shrunk with one distance unit per time unit. And then these matched regions are kind of frozen in time. So essentially this algorithm progresses along a timeline. Um, and so initially you, you essentially just initialize all the detection events um, and you sort of spawn these initial trivial alternating trees. Then as the regions collide, um, these high level, what we call sort of matcher events can occur. Um, and then I'll explain what it's in a minute. And eventually all the regions become matched and frozen and we can extract a solution. So yeah, let me just play this video. This is just an animation um, showing these different regions growing and shrinking. See the red ones shrink and the green ones are, are, are frozen. Um, and so yeah, I'll just play it again. This is just showing an example of, uh, of this algorithm. Um, and you can see it's essentially starting along, growing, essentially continues along a timeline um, and continues uh, until all the regions are frozen, at which point you can extract a solution. Um, and so uh, yeah, there are lots so there are these these matcher events. When I say that, I'm talking about when these different regions collide or interact. There are these kind of high level events, uh, rather than just the region growing and hitting a new say node in the detector graph. When these different regions collide, we refer to these as matcher events. Um, and let me just yeah, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give some examples of those in a minute. So yes, yeah, so we, we init initially we initialize all the detection events. Um, and then there are these different high level events that can occur. So the two alternating trees can glow and collide. Um, an alternating tree can hit itself uh, forming what's called a blossom. So it, an alternating tree can form essentially a cycle called a blossom. And these blossoms can uh, shatter, which I'll, I'll show in a minute. Um, and essentially this continues until everything is frozen and then we uh, can extract a solution. And because of a lack of time, I won't go into the details of all of these different events, but essentially there are, there are seven 
distinct events that can occur. So when different regions collide or interact or, or um, uh, shatter, there are seven distinct types of events that can occur at a high level when these regions are interacting. Um, and I won't go into them now for lack of time. And I realize I might not have time for much of the second <laughs> second project. But, um, uh, so yeah, the, as a, the architecture is uh, essentially as follows, we have these four different, um, uh, we have a tracker, a flutter, a match, and a driver. Uh, and so the driver you can think of as interfacing with the outside and preparing some initial problem state and interpreting the final, interpreting the final solution. The match, matcher is essentially for re responsible for reacting to these different collisions and implosions. So handling these high, these seven different high level events I told you about, these alternating trees. Um, these are the kind of these are the data structures which are present in the original Blossom algorithm, and so uh, it tra also tracks the alternating trees, forms and shatters these blossoms, which I haven't really defined in detail, um, and tracks and tracks these different uh, yeah, tracks these different events, and also controls the region growth. So depending on uh, whether a region is part of an alternating tree or a match or some other high level concept, it will either be shrinking, growing, or frozen. And so the matcher will determine which of these it should be, and inform us the flutter. And the flutter is just responsible for growing regions. So it's just there's some exploratory region of some given radius in the detector graph, and the flutter is just responsible for essentially growing this region in the detector graph. So it grows regions, shrinks regions, and notices whether when a region is co colliding or imploding. And then the tracker is responsible for the timeline and scheduling events. And so um, if you think of a, uh, so essentially, so the driver might say, okay, here are these detection events that we've received, run until it's finished. The match will then tell the flutter, okay, to run until something interesting happens. The flutter will then speak to the tracker, which is essentially like a fancy priority queue, saying, remind me to look at node five, say at time three. The tracker will then say to the flutter, look, it's time three, uh, look at node five. And the flutter might say, okay, there was a collision between region five and region six and ask the matcher, okay, what does that mean? Um, and then the matcher will then say, notice that maybe this means two alternating trees are colliding or, or, or something like this, and then inform the flutter. And this will continue until it finishes. So there are a couple of optim optimizations I'll mention briefly. Um, one is that we don't track the um, exact path used to uh, reach a node. Um, uh, so yeah, I mentioned how you have these kind of these compressed edges representing the shortest path between nodes. We don't actually store the full path. We just track the effect of this path on the logical outcome. Because remember, we only have to predict the logical outcome or the logical error, or more specifically, which logical errors have been flipped. Uh, and so this results. This sort of is a, is an optimization, um, which means that we only have to essentially store a bit mask um, on each edge representing the logical effect of a path. Uh, and we also store which detection event it was reached from. So when these regions are growing, this is what we store. Um, and so this logical observable mask, this effect of the logical outcome is essentially local information at the point of collision. So when two regions collide, you just XOR to bit masks. Um, and that gives you the effect, essentially, the logical effect of, of the path between these two regions. That's a useful optimization. Uh, and maybe I won't go into detail here. We also store the detection events which a, a region was reached from. Um, and this is useful at one point in the algorithm for, so it's for what's called shattering the blossoms, but maybe I won't go into the detail of that now. Um, and another thing that maybe I, I need to allow time for questions. Uh, there's also another algorithm union find, and I'll just say uh, that some of the optimizations we apply in blossoms, so blossoms are more, a more complicated algorithm which is more accurate than union find. So union find is a much simpler algorithm, which is slight, which is um, has a better worst case running time, although slightly so sort of very similar expected running time. Um, but yeah, some of our optimizations are also part of union find, particularly this compressed tracking idea I just mentioned, where you're tracking the logical effect of the paths. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just and I guess I also haven't had time to mention the priority. We use a radix heap as a priority queue, which is also another important optimization. Um, uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll just go on to the um, performance and running time and then either briefly give an overview of the results from the other project or take questions given that we're running a bit long time. Um, so the expected running time um, is roughly linear for error correction problems. 
So essentially at low physical error rates, the errors from small clusters, as I mentioned before, are exponentially distributed and they can be sort of matched independently. And so as a result, the running time scales roughly linearly with the number of uh, detection events. So each edge in this animation I'm about to show you is flipped with probability 2%. So the animation I showed you before was for a, not for an error correction problem, but for a kind of a contrived problem where the nodes were flipped at random just to make it clear, more a bit clearer to see what the data structures were. But this is a more typical error correction problem. And because of uh, the noise model, this is just several different problems one after the other. You can see that often it's just matching up nodes locally. And so uh, exponentially, uh, the, the clusters have exponentially small chance of being large. And so essentially you have lots of simple events being processed. Um, and as a result, it's important to be able to handle these particular events efficiently. And that's this is why the runtime is linear, um, expected linear time for typical error rates. So these are the this is the running time, these are the benchmarks. Um, so this is now, uh, so it's now 100,000 times faster than if you were just to use network X, say, let's suppose you just were an error correction so you, you wanted to just implement some decoder quickly in Python and you use a naive direct mapping. So it's a very naive implementation. But if you did that and you just went to NetworkX and you implemented this, na this naive like uh, sequential reduction that I showed at the beginning. So we're now 100,000 times faster than that. Um, and around 1,000 times faster than the previous version I mentioned, which was um, implementing the reduction, but truncating the graph and doing everything in C++. So it's around 1,000 times faster than that. Um, and it decodes both bases. Um, so both of the decoding problems you need to solve for a surface code uh, and under one like, microsecond per round up to distance 17. Um, so not quite distance 30, at distance 30, which is maybe the largest you might conceivably want to use in, in practice. I mean, distance 70 almost is enough, um, but distance 30, if you, want, uh, if you want to be able to handle that, maybe it takes three or four microseconds, I think maybe five microseconds per round. Um, but I mean, this algorithm can be parallelized. We didn't do that. So it's essentially, it solves the, I mean, the real time, essentially it's a, a uh, um, in, in practice, this is demonstrating that it could be a solution for the real time decoding problem for, for surface codes. Um, and so it's the, yeah, the same throughput uh, as a superconducting quantum computer up to the distance 17. Um, and yet yeah, it decodes distance 30 in less than five microseconds per round. So you might imagine you need some, if you wanted to decode in a CPU, maybe you need a multi-core CPU and to parallelize this, maybe you need say 10 cores or something um, to be safely below the um, required running time. And then it's roughly linear complexity. Um, and then, yeah, these are just different error rates. Maybe I won't go into details here, but I mean, the running time is, you know, it's maybe a two orders of magnitude faster rather than the three if you go to very high error rates above threshold. But I mean, this graph here is for the error rates you might want to use in practice um, for large quantum computers. If you're tuning in the threshold, then the overhead from error correction is just too high. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to use, use. Wouldn't, there'd be no point. <laughs> um, so there isn't much time left. So maybe there's probably, <laughs> Probably not enough time to talk about other projects. I could just give a quick overview of the results maybe. Um, I'm happy to go into it more, in more detail. Essentially this other, um, I'll give a schematic. This other project looked at, um, yeah, I'll give a two minute overview. <laughs> this other project uh, looks at um, essentially improving the accuracy over matching. Um, and I told you before that we're using this detector graph where each error mechanism can only flip one or two detectors. Essentially, we relax that assumption and develop an efficient decoder that can um, model more complicated noise models that actually always occur in, in practice. And the way we do that is we use a decoder called belief propagation. So we take this very complicated full noise model of um, some error correction circuits and we use belief propagation to essentially update the matching graphs to we incorporate, we use belief propagation, which takes into account these hyper essentially what would be a hyper in the detector graph that can't be handled by Blossom. Um, and we use belief propagation to update the error model, update the edge weights essentially in the matching graph, and then solve uh, the matching problem uh, or with union find um, to obtain some correction. Um, and then the results are that this does, uh, I mean, the, the running time is asymptotically the same as matching, although it's not yet optimized. So it's, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude slower in practice at the moment, but um, the, so this is one potential improvement to make, um, but the threshold is 
considerably higher than matching, um, go boost it from 0.81% to 0.94%. Um, uh, and then below thresholds, um, essentially it saves, I told you before, you can reduce the resource overhead. Um, so for example, here, this is showing that if you sort of extrapolate, well, I mean, this is a bold extrapolation, but let's suppose we assume that this extrapolation is true, <laughs> then this would imply that you have the same performance. Um, this is a logical error rate on the y-axis um, and the distance, the, the width of the surface code patch on the x-axis. That you know, you can achieve the same logical failure rates using uh, either a distance 29 matching decoded surface code or a distance 25 um, belief matching decoded, uh, the, the new decoder. Um, surface code. And so essentially you're saving 25%. Uh, you're reducing the number of physical qubits needed by around 25% by using a more accurate decoder. And this was uh, also used in this recent Google experiment. So to, because belief matching, this is to show why this is also useful to implement an experiment. So belief matching outperformed matching and some other decoders um, and was used in Google's surface code experiment last year um, to show that a distance five it kind of showed that scaling a surface code from distance three to distance five reduced the logical failure rate. Uh, it turned out you actually needed the only decoder which was um, accurate enough, the only efficient decoder that was accurate enough to do this um, was belief matching and the other ones didn't do that. So that shows that the threshold, being increasing the threshold can be the difference between you know, achieving suppression of errors or not. And this experiment was an example last year. Um, and so the accuracy approaches that of much more computationally expensive tensor network decoders. Okay, and then, so just to conclude, so I introduced faster matching, which is, um, uh, which is you, you, it's fast bottom, and it's a variant of the bottom algorithm tailored to error correction. Um, and it eliminates this quadratic overhead needed to construct the path graph. Um, and it essentially matches the throughput, the, re the required throughput of superconducting quantum computers up to distance 17. And I also very briefly, gave an overview of the results of this other projects on uh, more accurate matching and introduced belief matching, which is an efficient and more accurate decoder that combines belief propagation with matching. Um, and it handles hyperedge error mechanisms ignored by matching. And this has, as I said before, asymptotically the same running time, but is in practice um, currently much slower. So that's also some future work. And then um, also, uh, yeah, as I say, has higher thresholds for simulations and experiments. So yeah, future work could be optimizing the implementation of belief matching, um, for example, using sparse blossom as a subroutine, um, parallelizing, supporting parallelization by combining ideas from sparse blossom and um, fusion blossom. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention there's other work by fusion, but there's some parallel work by UA Wu on fusion blossom, which is conceptually has some similarities with our work, but differs in many of the details. I encourage you to look at that as well. Um, also, our work was implementing it as like a batch decoder. So it takes as input some, some fixed size graph and then some batch of syndrome data and then solves that. But in practice, you have a continuous stream of syndrome data coming in from some large fault tolerant quantum algorithm. That's what you need to be able to, that's the problem you need to be able to solve. So implementing it as like a streaming decoder rather than a batch decoder would also be future work. As well as say, implementing it on hard, hardware like FPGAs. Uh, maybe GPs um, will be another change, different architecture that could, could be considered. Um, so yeah, thanks. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Uh, amazing talk, I have to say. Uh, was super clear, and uh, I think it will generate a lot of uh, questions from the audience, but I have at least three different questions. The first one is related to the graph algorithm that you use. So you have considered basically, basically advanced and sparse Poisson algorithms, which is quite outdated. Uh, why you didn't use, uh, uh, let's say, modern graph algorithms for these kind of problems, which is not really modern because it was uh, already 30 years ago, and it's due to uh, Tarzan and Gabo, which is as a lower complexity, uh, which should be uh, square, uh, uh, well, radix of V times E in terms of big notation, which is a slide, mean... which is slightly, slightly faster. Is a uh, gab of, um, I don't remember, and I think it's, yes, yeah, so it's faster scaling algorithm for general graph matching problems. It's due to Harold Gabov and uh, Robert Tarjan. Is that is that the one, one of the ones, just like another variant of Blossom? 
Yeah, it's a, the variation of the yeah, master. yeah, yeah. So we weren't using master. Yeah, yeah. So we did. We weren't closely following. So we. I mean, there are many different implementations of um, Blossom over the years, and we weren't. When I say the ad, I sort of took referring to Edmund's algorithm just as the original, the original uh, introduction of the algorithm. But because we're we're solving such a different variant, we're not closely tracking the exact implementations of the other variants of Blossom because we don't need to. I mean, it's just too, the problem that we're solving, although it's similar, is too different to um, directly utilize the uh, other algorithms in literature. Um, at a high level, we can kind of compare them. So we're using a, um, we're essentially, we're using what's, our, our approach is analogous, analogous to um, uh, uh, essentially a multiple tree fixed delta approach is what it's referred to. So in the recent, if you look at the Kolmogorov uh, Blossom, uh, Blossom Five paper from like two thousand and nine. It talks about um, it kind of makes it as a discussion on the different approaches that have been made by various different optimizations of Blossom over the years. So ours is a what's called fixed delta ver multiple trees. So it means we're growing all the all of the automating trees simultaneously um, and at the same rate. Um, and so yeah, so I have it. I mean, you know, we haven't compared with all the different just because it's quite a different problem. Uh, I mean, for example, we, because we're growing these regions and discovering these events by growing these exploratory regions, it's quite different to these different approaches in literature. Where often there'll be say many different data structures used to detect the, the next tight edge, but it's like a different. It's the context is very different, so we're not really uh, we're not directly porting over some specific implementation of Blossom. We're taking the high level concepts and translating them to a very different context. And then implementing that. So yeah, I, um, I may, maybe I have to have a look at the exact paper you're referring to, but I would it may that. well be, yeah, it certainly may well be that there are some idea ideas and concepts in these other papers that we haven't spotted or that could be used to improve this uh, approach. But it is worth emphasizing that the running time, the bottleneck still in this, is not the higher level events, the mature events related to Blossom and the concepts in the original Blossom algorithm. Most of the time is spent just exploring the graph, the low level events that don't really have a relation to the high level kind of concepts in Blossom. So actually the exploratory region, the, the, the exploratory growth of the, the regions, these graph field regions, without the context of, with it, you know, rather than the handling of the high level context, which is what's relevant to these other approaches we're talking about, is what currently takes most of the runtime. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly it's just matching up local events. So yeah, it may, it may well be that there are ideas in the literature which can be utilized but yeah, it's because we're such a different context. We haven't properly, yeah, that's the answer. Okay, then my second question uh, is uh, related to possible risks. So Blossom is quite general, as you said. Uh, uh, did you investigate some uh, optimization in terms of algorithm design uh, by taking into account that your graph is a planar graph? Oh, no, we didn't at all. And the reason for that is that this all, we also wanted this to be generic as a software tool for researchers. So yeah, you could, uh, I mean, oh, you mean by, pla oh, by sorry, by planar, do you mean kind of, uh, do you mean literally a planar graph or? Yeah, because it seems- Well, it's like... not planar, it's a 3D graph actually. Sorry, I should have said that the 2D matching problem I showed, the animations were just to make it simple. That's the case where you haven't got measurement noise. Okay. I should have actually emphasised that actually these are all 3D graphs. So it, it's not planar. Yeah, the grid, the actual surface code is planar. That connectivity graph is planar, but yeah, the um the the decoding problem is three D. I should have I should have actually emphasised that. Yeah, that's an important point. You're repeating these measurement rounds, and that there's a third axis which is time. So there's a two D axis which is just the the actual physical chip, and there's a and the errors in two D space. And then because you're repeating these measurements like time over time, that corresponds to a third axis in time. So you have this three D detector graph. So maybe it's better approaching something that is uh, directly operate on multigraph instead of a bidimensional graph. Uh, multigraph, uh, yeah. More than the hyper age, hyper graph, multigraph. Uh, even though I think the the batches that you receive uh, are streamed, uh, so you need probably something that is uh, also works on the streaming. Yes, formation of the problem. Okay, this is my consideration because maybe I don't have uh, enough detail. My second question is related to the assumption over P. You mentioned that you test most of them on two percent and one percent of the slides. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I was wrong or no? Was two? Um, it depends on the noise model. Yeah, so two percent. That was two percent was without when you it was a very simplified noise model, which is a two D graph and and no measurement errors for the kind of the circuit level. 
the kind of the typical noise model normally considered for these gate based devices. Um, I've got to go back a bit. It was oh. basically 0.1 percent essentially. Okay, so my question is related: to, Would this the impact on the noise model in the density of the resulting uh, of the resulting graph? So if I increase p, I have a denser graph. Yes. So rough, the number of detection events, so the number of flipped detectors is roughly proportional to the um, physical error rate. Uh, I mean, it's not quite, but at low error, that's a good approximation at low error rates. Um, so yeah, the, the, the fraction, essentially your, the, the, the algorithm considers like a, some subgraph, which is determined by the density and, and location of these detection events. And as the error rate increases, there's, there are many more flipped detectors. There are many more detection events. And so the, the runtime scales with the error rate. Um, so, but I, we did look at, we, we looked at both above threshold and below threshold. So we've got results for kind of the full span of noises and models you might, might use in practice. So maybe if you observe different uh, errors uh, or at least the percentage of the errors due, for example, to some external events and, radiation, for example, or something like that, not just the coincidence of the qubits. Uh, maybe you can also change uh, the techniques for uh, detecting and correcting the errors as well. So which means yeah, you... prob probably an approach like uh, uh, an ASIC-based approach is not the best things because always solving the same way, the same uh, uh, type of errors uh, according to some one specific error. Uh, noise model, right? So yeah, that's true. That's definitely it. Makes sense investigating uh, all the architectures that are programmable in order to have this dynamic behavior in the correct codes. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, okay. and that's actually one of the, yeah. yeah. And I my last question that. is uh, on the uh, your future direction on the hypergraph part. Uh, it's truly an hypergraph or is a bi uh, biparted graph? Uh, I didn't see the, how to model this. Oh. I have to suspect that this is a biparted graph, so you still apply another graph algorithm, which is the extension of Blossom for biparted graph. Is this is a truly uh, biparted graph? Because biparted yeah, graph are... of hyper graphs. And that you're right, so there are... amplify your actually your work because you have a lot of different heuristics that you can use. Yeah, exactly. So there are two different. Yeah, so there are the bipartite graph is this one. There, essentially, it's a different representation. The bipartite graph has two types of nodes, the, the detector nodes here and the error mechanism nodes here. This is, the, this is the Tanner graph. This differs from the detector graph I showed you before. The detector graph is just where you consider the subset of, subset of these error mechanisms as error mechanism nodes that are only incident to two detectors. If this, this one here, for example, is incident to two detectors, so you replace, replace this node by an edge. Mm -hmm. That's the distinction. Whereas you could you could say you could think of this Tanner graph as being either a, a hypergraph in the detector graph uh, um, definition or just a bipartite graph in the Tanner graph representation. But the Blossom algorithm is applied to the detector graph, which can only consider um, error mechanisms which flip two detectors. So that's a distinction. But yes, belief propagation is run on the bipartite Tanner graph. And then that is then mapped to a detector graph with updated edge weights. Okay, so in that sense, so yeah, okay, uh, that was clear. So in that case, in that case, uh, you cannot use uh, faster algorithms for matching them because there are a uh, family of graph algorithms that work, are quite efficient. For example, uh, op graph the car, if I remember correctly, is one of the fastest. Yeah. So a, yeah, but maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, may Maybe there are some interesting ideas to to directly apply some matching type algorithm to this bipartite graph, but it's not trivial, yeah. Yeah, it's not trivial uh, at all. And uh, I yeah. see that uh, you simplify also the problem by consider an entire batch graph, uh, but uh, the yeah. problem truly is on the streamed graph. Yeah. You can potentially yeah. stream the graph. And actually most of the architecture there, are, especially those that are uh, emerging now, for example, processing memory uh, in-memory devices, have a, a very high efficiency in terms of latency when you have the streams. So maybe we can also explore this. Yeah. Uh, Progressive yeah. memory basically adds a CPUs, a small CPUs, or like risk five CPUs inside the memory, which means right. you have uh, three stack memories and one of the layers instead of uh, 
having the control part, you have also have compute units. So basically, you cut uh, cut the cut off the the fetch and the code. So because you have the computation near to the data, so if you uh, stream this kind of units, for example, for this C, uh, control circuits of the quantum system directly to these kind of systems you immediately have the computation out of there. So it's a very low latency architecture. And I think it's uh, very nice to apply for these kind of problems. Yeah. There are one uh, commercial vendor that provide uh, actually this kind of devices. So we are also in getting in touch with them just for accelerating graph algorithm. Maybe we can consider also uh, this specific use case, which is actually fits uh, their, the characteristic of the, of the architecture. Yeah. Okay. I have potentially have more questions about some assumption on the errors and parameters, but I want to give the the chance to the other guys to ask questions. Thank you so much. So uh, I I have a few questions. Uh, I I hope there are not too many. So one of the first ones actually uh, more of a curiosity. Is you shown in the in your second paper about the more accurate decoders uh, a slide in which you had uh, data regarding uh, machines with more than a thousand and a few hundred qubits? Uh, are those coming from data extrapolations or are they actually coming from real experiments? Ah, so this you mean this graph here on these very large distance surface code exactly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. these are simulations. Yeah, so. So I think in experiments have only gone up to distance sort of seven, you know, five and seven are the largest normally implemented in experiments so far. Um, so yeah, this is, these are simulations. Uh, and okay. I yeah, recommend looking at STEM uh, as an uh, excellent okay. simulator. Yeah, so other open source software, if you're looking at a research with is STEM and that's written by Craig Goodney and that's can perform very fast simulations. Uh, so the simulation, the actual, the, the decoder is fast, but actually the simulation of the uh, is even faster, and that was also a result from a couple of yeah, years yeah, ago. Like yeah. So I was about to ask because I wanted to know how you could generate the data to then decode quickly enough. Because that that right. would have been my my question. So that that was my first question, and that that's that's all right. Um, and more on the technical side. Uh, right, of uh, course, with the Marcio, uh, uh, just to clarify because uh, Marcio is working on. Uh, generating a simulator for errors according to some noise model. So that's yeah. why it's for the right. how to generate in a and what is the assumption behind it? Ah the, the assumption is a clifford. So the actually this is an important assumption which is that STEM makes the assumption that these are a particular type of errors, these are Pauli errors in particular subset of circuits, it's like stabilizer circuits. Um, and so these yeah. are Clifford simulations. And so yeah, these are which some of you are probably, probably familiar with. But th this this that's this is the assumption here, yeah. So it's not for for a generic noise model, you couldn't uh, hope to simulate systems like this large, yeah. But for for stabilizing okay. circuits, yeah, you can. Yeah. That 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 was what uh what I was going to ask is like my 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 issue is that of course if you consider poly errors, like you can simulate them pretty efficiently, like up to a certain degree, but uh. Have you have you considered like the effects of, uh, for example, non poly errors like non unitary errors happening on the real device and how your um, how the, the the surface code and thus the decoder can eventually detect and or adapt to these non unitary errors? I'm thinking, ex for example, um, the the recently highlighted uh, high energy events. Uh, detected by the Google Quantum AI team uh, on their on their Sycamore chip, in which they had to filter some data because a uh, high energy event was just heightening the threshold for the surface code error correction. So, do you have any insight on this? C can you give us insight on this? I'd be very curious to know. Yeah, so for the high energy events, yeah, I mean, I think the hard there are kind of fixes at the hardware hardware level for that, which is probably the most uh, promising. But you could imagine, for example, uh, there are have been some kind of papers looking at uh, using kind of clustering type algorithms to ident identify when some uh, um, high energy event may have occurred, and then uh, kind of uh, changing the structure of the circuit adaptively, and then also the matching graph. So I mean, yeah, there are adaptive changes you can make both to the circuit implemented. Um, 
and also the um, decoder to handle that. Yeah, so uh, often what's done is if some subset of qubits has been uh, broken temporarily by some cosmic ray, you can actually change the circuit. You can treat, you know, you're reducing the distance of the code, but it's not permanently breaking it. If it's some region in the code, you change the circuit and essentially modify the structure of the stabilizers measured to be uh, treating it essentially as like what's called a subsystem code. Um, and yeah, so that's that's one way of doing it. In terms of experimental data and how it performs, a couple more things to say about that. One is it was, so in this, the experiment I mentioned before from last year, this is all experimental data. And so one thing you can do is, um, firstly, obviously no, no longer need to simulate because it's an actual experiment. So this is taking into account more complicated noise models and just experimentally evaluating the performance of the decoder. Um, but also you can empirically construct the, the detector. I mean, the detector graph as well is constructed, the edge weights in the detector graph, and the structure of it are constructed from these Clifford simulations. Um, and propagating parallelly through Clifford circuits, but that can be uh, changed to a more empirical approach, where you you look at the correlations between different de detection events in the experimental data, and kind of empirically construct a detector graph. So that's what's been done here, and so we can see that the different. This is the showing the different performance of different decoders for this realistic noise model. And then finally, there's some work from about a month or two ago by DeepMind and the quantum AI team, Google quantum AI team in a collaboration showing that um, a kind of a machine learning approach can also do slightly better than this sort of tensor network. This, op this is the optimal one. The tensor network is the optimal, but given the assumptions on the detector graph from like, analy like analyzing the data and constructing some TANA graph essentially, an independent noise model, but that independence is also an assumption. The fact that this error model can be independent it's true for many common Pauli noise models, but in the experiment, that's also an assumption. And so the tensor network decoder here makes that assumption in representing, it's, it's optimal in some sense, but only given this assumption of the, of the independence, but then this machine learning decoder again was kind of agnostic to that um, and uh, just learned to correctly predict the logical outcome. And so, yeah, you can also, there's also a paper um, by Johannes Bausch and, and others um, from a couple of months ago. So again, you, you would say that uh, if we were to have in the future a more accurate description of what happens at the um, hardware level uh, with respect to errors, so have a more accurate noise model uh, compared comparatively to the poly uh, gates errors we use right now, we could have better performance from the same decoders, basically, just because the assumptions we make beforehand are more accurate, basically, that could happen. That's true. That is correct. Yes. Um, I think we're kind of, the, the, I don't think that you'd expect, uh, I mean, in terms of the accuracy, um, yeah, that, that is, that is, that is true. But I, I say the accuracy, I mean, the, the, this machine learning decoder, for example, didn't beat the test network decoder by a huge amount. Um, and general, so there is a different, there is an improvement you can have, but it, uh, it won't be sort of, I wouldn't expect it to be dramatic. Like the, the approximation is already reasonably good. But yeah, it's, it's correct that, yeah, you can improve it further, yes. Okay, and uh, just as the last question, um, it's more of a, let's say, uh, thoughts experiment rather than a question is, uh, of course, if you increase the distance of surface codes, they have better resilience to errors, that's, that's a given. But of course, you're using more hardware to encode the same logical qubit, all right? So do you foresee in the future with the improvement, the technological improvements in the build quality of uh, quantum devices for surface codes to actually lower in uh, distance and just move towards uh, lower distance surface codes? Because right now, of course, there's a, there's a there's a threshold between having a larger surface code and having a given uh, hardware error that you know makes the larger surface code more convenient with respect to the smaller one. But once the devices will become, let's say, uh, resilient enough or, or rather precise and accurate enough, will we? Do you think we will move again towards the smaller surface codes, or we will instead move towards the larger ones because we'll have more qubits and thus we can, you know. Uh, don't worry too much about the fact that the surface code is taking up so many physical qubits. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, this is actually what's often done is these called terraquop plots. It's called terraquop. 
Uh, and what this is doing is answering that question essentially. Uh, and it's answering the question, um, how many physical qubits are needed to achieve um, a failure rate of one in a trillion? Um, and that's essentially saying you're only you're using just enough physical qubits to achieve the code distance needed to achieve that logical failure rate. And so there are these graphs which kind of plot, uh, I wish I had one on the slide, but I don't, but um, I could find one. But essentially the x-axis is the physical error rate and then the y-axis is the number of physical qubits required for this target logical failure rate, which obviously you could change. And so you can see exactly, that's why it's a very useful analysis for algorithm codes and also comparing surface codes with other codes. Um, is that does show you both the threshold, but also it shows you how the overhead reduces with the physical error rate. And so, yeah, so normally people might say using distance 20 or 30, which is normally assuming say 0.1%. Um, but if you go, you know, an order of magnitude lower then maybe, you know, you only, uh, only need distance 10 or something. Um, so yeah, lower physical error rates does reduce the overhead. And another thing that can reduce the overhead is um, more efficient error correcting codes, of course. So these quantum LDPC codes, but that requires, um, usually requires, well, it has to require, um, more long range uh, connectivity between qubits, which doesn't have to require. But I mean, there are ways of implementing these on on these nearest neighbor architectures by concatenating a surface code with, say, an LDPC code. So there's um, some recent work on that as well. But yeah, so yeah, so in terms of improvements, certainly reducing the error rate reduces the overhead. You can also switch to um, these LDPC codes if the architecture supports it. Um, and there's been some exciting work recently on that as well. Enough. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Any other question? Uh, I have a question more about uh, the um, algorithmic part. Uh, you said that one of the project is to parallelize the surface code, the sparse blossom algorithm. And I have a simple question. Well, in your opinion, which is the harder part in doing this? It's more a problem uh, about the load balancing, about the synchronization, um, or about the work balances. Uh, I don't know. What's your opinion about it? What's the hardest part? Um, one thing is I wouldn't say it necessarily that hard. It's just like we didn't get around to doing this project. Uh, I haven't personally yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think it requires modifying slightly the higher level events. And you essentially want to break down the problem into chunks, uh, maybe some D by D by D chunks or something similar. Um, as to, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, without having tried to tackle this myself personally, I've been working on other projects since this, so I'm different, I'm related. But so yeah, I'm not sure I had to best answer that question other than I think it's, yeah, it's not, uh, I'm not sure the best approach and um there's nothing inherently challenge like there's nothing inherent uh, there's nothing inherently uh impossible about it or uh, it, it's a quite a parallelizable algorithm just because i what i showed you before with the, the er errors being matched locally um it means you can consider separated blocks of uh, of this 3d matching graph and they will interact they'll only interact sort of near the boundary with some small region of the boundary so you kind of need to modify the high level matching events uh matcher events near the boundary um but yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't yet kind of tackled that problem myself, so, but I've been interesting to discuss. Uh, I have a, a follow-up question roughly on this. Uh, there is some, is there some studies where they correlate the distance, the density, the errors? Uh, because I had the suspect that a lower density, a lower distance may have low, uh, larger errors or at least a larger propagation. So make more events and then afterwards you have denser graphs. Or there is some study on that direction, the topology of the errors. So basically, what kind of graph really we have? Um, it should be fairly homogeneous with, I mean, the system, I mean, uh, yeah, I didn't notice some big difference. We looked at kind of the distribution of these alternating trees and blossoms and the size of them, different error rates. Um, uh, and it didn't change too much depending on the graph size. I mean, it's fairly, and the, and the, the error rate is sort of uniform. So the, the structure locally of the graph is the same regardless of how large it is really, other than at the bound, I guess, with the boundary. Um, yeah, because yeah, I guess the smaller system size of the boundary has a larger effect. Um, it's kind of the yeah. finite size effect leads to the boundary. Yeah. Okay, okay. I don't see that the size at the end is a, a real problem. The problem is uh, in order to, the biggest constraint is the latency. 
and this may change uh, uh, depending on the architecture and depending on the density and uh, how much the components that you try to match together are balanced. So if I have a stream yeah. processing disks, it's, uh, probably we need uh, to investigate better what kind of topology and how to evolve the topology according to the errors. Right. Um, yeah, and once it says it's not the it's more the throughput than the latency, which is the throughput is the most important thing to. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure I follow. Uh, I'm not sure I follow precisely the question. But, um, no, no, yeah, your answer. Uh, there is no specific work that investigates the topology, basically. Oh, look, sorry, by the topology, what do you mean? Sorry. The topology is uh, how they look, the graph looks like. Oh, it always looks the same, as in locally, it looks the same. So it's just, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's the, there's a boundary. So it, you know, the graph just looks, um, except for at the boundary. Um, and yeah, there, it's uh, it's just, yeah, locally it looks the same. So locally, it's just translationally invariant, in fact, except for at the very, at the boundary where there are some edges which are essentially chopped in half. Um, uh, these half inches of boundary, but it's translationally invariant for a typical, say, surface code problem. Mm -hmm. um, for different codes, like hyperbolic codes, or the, I mean, there are different, more exotic codes which uh, do have different topologies. Um, but um, for surface codes, you're just scaling up the size of the surface code batch. Yeah, it's just translationally invariant except for the boundary. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Uh, any other question, Joel, uh, Lorenzo? Not from me. No, not from my side. Okay, I would like to thank you, uh, Oscar, again for his uh, great talk. And uh, Oscar, maybe uh, are you will be you available at some point, maybe for checking our papers or uh, contribute uh, also the lightweight contribution, maybe just checking if the our assumption are correct, uh, or also visit us because uh, from what I understood, uh, you will start. Uh, soon in Google and maybe we have more restriction uh, in uh, getting in touch. Uh, um, or you are quite, yeah. quite flexible. Maybe you can visit us in uh, in May, something like this. I don't know. Yeah, I'll, uh, I mean, I'll get back to you on that. I'll have to just chat to the to my manager and so on. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be great to stay in touch certainly and to, in, in some way or another and I'll see what can, what can be done. <laughs> Okay, so guys, so let's thank uh, Oscar for his amazing talk and hope to see you soon, Oscar. Well, yeah, you too. Thank you so much for again for inviting me. Thanks. Thank Richard. you. Thank you. Bye. Again, bye. Thank you. Bye.